without further ado, El Señor. <laughs> <laughs> El Señor Icorn, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great. It's great to be with you this afternoon. Well, look, I, um, I, 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 I haven't completed your book, but there is one segment of my book which should tell every single one of our listeners today that you better get that book. And by the way, the link for that book is right there on, my, uh, on the blog for the show today. But uh, the one thing this man said is, health care is a right. Welcome aboard, Ed. How are you doing today? Terrific. Great to be here. Well, look, it, it, it's great to have you here. First of all, tell me about what made you write the book that is going to save us $1 trillion. Mm -hmm. Well, originally, uh, Dr. Hutchinson and I talked about writing a book on health care in 2009, but uh, we got busy with other things, and in the beginning of 2017, we read Paul Ryan's bill that he was uh, proposing to change health care to uh, basically eliminate Obamacare. The Congressional Budget Office said that within five years, 24 million people would lose their health care if this became law. And also, uh, people who were between 60 and 64, their cost of health care could go up as much as 700% uh, if that became law. So we thought um, um, Mr. Ryan was really talking about how to save money, not how to fix health care. So that was a big motivation for us to write a book that talked about how to provide care for everyone, but reduce the cost of health care in our country. Now, there's a part of the book that was interesting because what you said in, that, in the book is that, uh, wait a minute, what they're doing is they're reducing the cost of health care or reducing the insurance costs for younger people and increasing it for older people. Doesn't that mm -hmm. defy what insurance is really about, that we all put into one pool so that whoever of us is unlucky gets mm -hmm. taken care of? And we really shouldn't be talking about, oh, uh, we, we talk about it too much as a product, don't we? Well, I think that's certainly part of the problem. You know, one of the things that we need to deal with in healthcare is uh, making sure the networks of uh, coverage, the people being covered, is large enough so that uh, those people who are healthier are able to help cover the cost of those of us who are not as healthy and, and perhaps older. Uh, and that's one of the failings, I believe, of uh, Obamacare, is that not enough people were in the, in the system in the various states that had smaller networks, and it resulted in, uh, you know, cost increases that, uh, you know, really uh, affected a lot of people. And the cost of care went up, and the deductible levels went up, and, and that made care unaffordable. You know, today, when Obamacare started, the concern was there were 50 million uninsured people in the United States, and it was important to put forward uh, coverage for them in some way. But today, there are still 29 million people uninsured, and because of the change in the cost structure, another 40 million people are underinsured. So, you know, people do not get the health care they need in a timely way, which makes their care more expensive. Now, a part of your book is an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, tidbit that kind of shocked me, where you said how unfair Obamacare was for the middle class, given that the middle class had this huge deductible and huge premium, $1,200 on average for, uh, per person, I believe, while it turned out that uh, somebody at 138% of poverty, which means they're not in poverty, they just make X more dollars, only ended up with a $300 bill. Why don't you tell me, how did, how did that inequity come about? Well, the... Um the idea was, uh, as I understand it, that people up to the 138% of the poverty line could get uh, their care subsidized by Medicaid, which is why uh, 10,000 or 10 million of the people who got coverage through Obamacare fall into that category. The example we, we showed in the book about our concern about fairness was in the state of New Hampshire. And it was a, a family where a uh, husband and wife worked uh, they had a family income of $80,000 a year, they had one child, they had an individual um, deductible uh, of, I believe, $6,000 a person, and their monthly yeah. premiums were $1,200, okay? That's the one. Um, yeah, and we just felt that there's a basic unfairness there. If I'm making 138% of the poverty line and my insurance is $300 a month, why would I want to get a better job? 
because my insurance costs would go through the roof compared to what my operating budget was at that the salary level. So we, we thought that that was a real problem uh, that got worse because of the uh, lack of competition that actually evolved in Obamacare. You know, when there are only two or three providers in a state, that works more like an oligopoly so that the price competition is quite limited. And if the network is small, that means the costs go, go up uh, on a per capita basis as opposed to you know, uh, a network where you have a normal distribution of healthy people and people who may have health care problems. Okay, I want to ask you uh, first a few things about, uh, because you made a, some comparison with um, different structures around the world. So what I want to mm -hmm. ask you specifically is, are these other structures around the world really better than ours, worse than ours, on par with ours? Tell, let the folks know from an art, as somebody who knows the, the reality about that. Mm -hmm. Well, it, there's a great report that we referenced in the book from the Commonwealth Foundation, and they've been doing this study for a number of years in 11 uh, what they call um, um, high-income countries. And uh, in that study, the other 10 countries either have uh, the uh, essentially a, the German plan where uh, insurance is paid for by employers, uh, or they, you know, have a general tax plan like they do in Great Britain, uh, and in that situation, the physicians are employees of, of, of the system. Uh, the, the consumer response is actually better in the other countries than it is in our country with respect to uh, the care that's received in, in those countries. Um, you know, and, and the interesting thing is if you look at our country, uh, if you look at Medicare, Medicaid, military insurance, TRICARE, and care for uh, an American Indians, 45% of our people are already on government plans one way or another. 45%? Yeah. Wow, I didn't yeah. realize it was that high, but yeah. Well, take a, there's 70 million people on Medicare, 57 million people on, uh, I'm sorry, 70 million on Medicaid, 57 million on Medicare, 2 million on um, the Indian plan, and there's not 9 million people on uh, military health care and veterans care. Right. So if you add up all those numbers, it gets to be about 45% of our population. And at the same time, Medicare is growing at about 10,000 people a day. So, you know, uh, there are more and more people who are on plans that are in some way supported by the government now. Okay, well, I, I want to go to the title of your book because I think that is what that is really what we're all about. How are we going to save $1 trillion? My, my preference is Medicare for all, and I'll go into a little bit about that later on, but you mm -hmm. have your own plan that you came up with your partner, and uh, I'm, in, I'm like superbly interested in hearing exactly how this would work. Okay, well, uh, what we did was uh, we analyzed Medicare's cost segments, and we determined, uh, you know, the annual cost for Medicare is about uh, $10,500 or something like that a person. So what we did is we looked at the cost segments of Medicare. We also felt that because 17% of our economy is involved with health care, it would be very difficult to simply eliminate the insurance industry. So we wanted to create an environment where the um, uh, insurance industry could compete with a public option. And uh, what we did was um, calculate that we could provide care on the Medicare schedule for people under 65 for about uh, $4,700 uh, per person per year uh, for a single person. So we compared that number with the Carnegie uh, Family Foundation that does a, a survey every year of the cost of insurance. And uh, the average cost for uh, you know, uh, single coverage is about uh, $7,700 a year. So we figured out how we could reduce that by uh, a uh, by 30 percent. So for the 58 percent of our uh, companies in the United States provide insurance that covers more than 150 million people. It's the largest coverage area. Mm -hmm. So we're saying if we could go to companies with a public can plan, which in the book we called All Care. Mm -hmm. So if, if All Care could offer in the market coverage for $4,700 for a single person and save companies 30% of their insurance cost. If they all went to a product at that price point, how much would they save? And for those companies, they'd save $250 billion a year in aggregate. And we also calculated for the companies that do not provide insurance, we believe they should provide coverage for everyone, 
what would be the net impact on industry and they would have to pay you know for their insurance so the net impact on industry if everyone was able to buy insurance at that level would be about a reduction of 175 billion dollars a year we also believe that we should have a single charge master for hospitals if you if you break your leg why does it cost more in one hospital versus another now there should be adjustments for the cost of living in various parts of the country but we believe because hospitals cost a trillion dollars a year we should be able to save about 200 million dollars 200 billion dollars a year out of those dollars because we want to uh, remove bureaucracy, simplify billing, and, and uh, eliminate the need for the large number of coders that exist. On average, large hospitals, 25% of their staff is involved with billing. So if we could simplify the billing process so that um, you know, it could be more streamlined, uh, that would be uh, very helpful to hospitals and to doctors. Right now, hospitals and insurance companies and physicians, we spend 14% of our total health care spend on billing alone. In other countries, it's been three to five percent. So, you know, that's another big area of savings if we could simplify billing and, uh, you know, make it a little fairer and also eliminate hospital markup of their supplies. They should be able to mark up their supplies by a percentage for inventorying, but they shouldn't be able to mark it up as much as they do in some cases. So, if you look at those things, plus the idea that um, some people think medical waste in our country for administrative purposes and actual product purposes is about 30% of our health care costs. You know, there is a, a medical uh, society, 80 medical societies that want to encourage physicians to save money on clinical costs. We believe physicians could uh, develop savings in the range of uh, $50 billion a year as opposed to $300 billion a year uh, to you know, help deliver the cost savings that we're talking about. So between those things and working to reduce the cost of pharmaceuticals in our country, we believe we could achieve savings of a billion to a billion two. Now, if I'm off because these are very big squishy numbers, right. we'll uh, save you a billion. Well, that's that's pretty good as opposed still, to yeah. that. Right now, yeah. let me uh, let, let me let me kind of get in here to say uh, say this. I mean, one of the things that you pointed out in the beginning of your um in your in your the beginning of your soliloquy right there was that. Uh, given that we uh, we have the insurance companies entrenched already, it would be difficult to move forward. So I think in a lot of ways, and this is my biggest concern with uh, healthcare reform generally, and that is we are trying to fit something into a defined model as opposed to trying to redefine the model altogether to fit what we need, what we want. So um, uh, my question to you, why do we even need insurance companies? Why, why is there a need for insurance companies if we can simply say there is one huge risk pool, the American population? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, all of the other countries that you asked me about, about 10% of their markets are insurance uh, companies in addition to uh, their uh, Medicare for All or universal coverage plans. Uh, we think that competition is a good thing if you define it properly. What we're saying is we want to change the operating envelope of each of these segments, of the insurance industry, of the hospital industry, and the pharmaceutical industry as well. And we're saying that if we can provide uh, a public option that uh, costs you know, 30% less than the insurance company option, they have to figure out how to compete with that at that price point. Also, in uh, Medicare, uh, People can buy Medicare Advantage. In our plan, we're saying we don't want Medicare Advantage to be in the basic plan. However, if you want to buy it, buy it. If, you know, money. Exactly. But that's an opportunity for insurance companies to uh, compete in a segment of the market if they would like to do that. I so what we're... Go ahead. I, yeah, I like, I like what you just said. I, I mean, I'm for that. I'm not for making uh, uh, private insurance companies illegal. I am for creating a basic a, a basic tier of healthcare that doesn't need anything from a private insurance company. However, if you want petals on your bed and you want better food and you want in other words, I'd like to have a baseline that we all are entitled to. And then if you want bells and whistles, you get a, a health insurance company. So otherwise, and I, I don't know that you've uh, you, you've convinced me yet that there's even a need for health insurance companies for basic health care 
Well, what we're saying is because we like the idea of creating a very difficult uh, competitive market. We're saying to the insurance company, okay, any company in the United States can buy insurance for 30% less than the average price in the United States. Mm -hmm. Can you compete with this? And I believe what would happen is some creative companies, I, I think particularly the Blue Cross companies, would find ways to compete with that because many of them are nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Okay. And secondarily, insurance companies will say, we can't really compete in that, perhaps, or maybe they will if they get creative, but they'll say, Medicare Advantage for all. Uh, for people under 65, that's a market that we could uh, exist in. And it would change the size of their industry. It would get smaller, but it would be very specialized. The other thing is we're saying if you, you want concierge medicine, buy it. Just as you said, rose petals on your thing. And, buy it. You want concierge, right, buy it. Right. And, and that's, where so, I, that's where I'm with you. Yes. The thing that we have to deal with in, in, a, in a very um, fundamental way is the physician shortage. We need to make health care for physicians an attractive market. You know, in our chapter that we wrote, Let Doctors Be Doctors, we discussed the idea that, you know, burnout in physicians is very high. It's the highest in any profession in the United States. Uh, and now physicians spend you know, more than three hours a week uh, talking with insurance companies or writing letters to insurance companies to get the care their patients need. So, you know, we also have physicians with incredible debt uh, for going to school. There is uh, an article that was in the Wall Street Journal about a dentist uh, in, in the western part of our country. He went to a very prestigious school in Southern California. He had a lot of debt. And starting in 2007, there's a program where if you spend 10% uh, of your disposable income uh, on your debt after 20 years, whatever's left over you know, can be uh, forgiven. Okay, But because of changes in interest rates, this guy's monthly payment is less than the accrued interest every month. He now owes more than a million dollars. When his 20 years are up, he'll owe two million dollars. And when it's forgiven, because it's counted as income, the IRS will say he got $700,000 in income. Okay? Right. And he's, there are 31 professionals in healthcare with the same problem, this one gentleman. On average, uh, physicians get through that 20-year period, and they have to pay uh, taxes in addition to ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Uh, you know, I think uh, loans to physicians going to school should be at one flat interest rate. And I also think that if their loan is forgiven, they shouldn't be taxed on it at the end of paying for it for a long period of time. In addition to that, the American uh, Medical College Association says in the next five years, we can have a shortage between 35,000 and 65,000 physicians. Between 15,000 and 35,000 of them will be primary care docs. And as it is right now, 30% of our physicians are over 55 years of age. Hospitals are now making physicians who are 70 or older take tests to see if they can continue to practice. So, you know, and then there are parts of the country, particularly the southern part of our country, where uh, women have to uh, you know, get C-sections because the obstetrician is 90 minutes away from where they live. And, you know, uh, infant, uh, mortality in our country is growing. It's worse than a lot of other countries now. A lot of third world so, countries, yeah. Cuba has a better rate than us. Well, yeah, Cuba has a, a plan to export physicians to other third world countries, yeah. uh, uh, which is quite successful. Uh, so, I, you know, I think we have to address the physician issue, especially if we go to coverage for all, because as it stands now, we don't have enough physicians to cover but everyone. Let me, I want to I want to kind of interject right there because I'm, I, I don't people make the statement that you just made and I don't see how they do it with a straight face. Uh, <laughs> I, I, what I mean is when you say. Uh, especially since we're going to for coverage for all, we're going to need a whole lot more doctors, which means right now we're saying our society suffices by having people just get sick and die because they can't see a doctor. I mean, it, it, it no, blows so my bad. mind when I hear well, that. And the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development of the UN tracks 35 countries. This year went to 36. Mm -hmm. Who was the 36th country? I'm curious. I, I don't know. I, I didn't <laughs> read the word, but I, have to tell you, I don't know. But in the report of 35, the U.S. ranks 33rd on, on graduating physicians. Uh, we graduate seven and a half physicians for every 100,000 people in our country. Mm -hmm. And I think the two countries behind us were Israel and Mexico. Uh, wow. But 
everyone else, you know, produces more physicians than we do. And I think part of the challenge is the cost of the education and, you know, the feeling that a number of physicians have about the careers that they have. You know, they, they want to help people. They want to treat people. We have great research in the United States. We have great cancer research and great uh, stroke research. Uh, but in terms of delivering care, uh, you know, we make it very complicated based on the insurance system uh, and the coverage and system we have today. Yeah, I mean, and that is one of the reasons. It looks like we have a call. Let me just see if the person wants to ask you something or, or is this for the other segment. Uh, caller, you are on. Did you want to ask uh, uh, Dr. Eichen anything? Yeah, uh, this is Mike Cesar. Yeah, uh, Mike. The, the question I've got for him is, you know, out, out of all this stuff that he's talking about, <laughs> one thing is still kind of missing, mm -hmm. which which we have for all under all other industries mm -hmm. and that's really a visible price structure to where you know we we as consumers really never see a price because we're uh we're having third parties pay for all this stuff i mean you're right about that i've okay. seen that you've seen that too right doctor uh, yes, actually, in our book, we do discuss uh, pricing and uh, having one charge master for all of the things people can be billed for to simplify hospital billing and, uh, you know, the statements you might receive from uh, an insurance um, carrier or from uh, of the government if you have government coverage. So we, we agree that that needs to be done in a much better way. In fact, today, in most hospital bills, in many hospital bills, there are errors because of the complexity of the bill. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, we think that's important too. I thought you mentioned that earlier that you had this list when you created your uh, healthcare for all bill that actually yeah. uh, listed for, but I think you were listing it for the competitors, not necessarily for the clients. Is that right? Well, in the book, we listed it that way, but we, we call for four major things to be done, and one of them is a, a standard charge master for all charges you know, uh, in the country so that people can see what, what everything costs in a much simpler way on their bills. Got you. Anything else you want to ask him, Mike? Well, see, Medicare actually has a charge schedule. Yes, it does. Um, and that, that, that's the thing. I mean, it, it, in the private, insur uh, private insurance, it basically goes off of that schedule. Now, why wouldn't we just make it to where hospitals and doctors and, and everyone put up publicly their pricing? And then people can come in, they can take a look, and see, the problem is, Really, I mean, no matter if it's insurance or, you know, a, a, a charge master or single payer or, you know, Medicare for all, it, it the, the consumer is not in charge. See, the, if the consumer was able to go in and look, because it, like 95% of care really is, is just, a, you know, it's on your time, basically. It's not, it's not emergency. It's not you know, any of that kind of stuff. You, you can actually weigh a little bit. Okay, so people are able to shop around, and if people were able to shop around, they say, hey, insurance, I've got a better deal for you. Okay, Mike, I want, let, uh, let's you know, answer I, the shop around. over here. Let's answer the shop around thing, Mike, because you know, I'm it, curious about what what uh, Mr. Um, what Ed is going to say about, about the yeah. chaperone. Is that, is that a really a feasible thing, uh, the, the consumer really? Is it, you see, I, don't, I have never found a consumer knowledgeable, including myself as a mm -hmm. consumer of healthcare, to be knowledgeable enough to really do this shopping around thing. What, what do you say? Well, I think the way consumers shop around for healthcare is they talk to their family and friends and ask them, uh, who would you go for uh, to for whatever my problem is? And usually in, in that format, people will say, gee, I went to this doctor. He did a great job. I, I, you know, took care of me. I, I'm much better. I went to this other, uh, you know, facility, and I really wasn't happy with it. I think you ought to go to X instead of Y. Uh, what we're saying is if we have a one charge master, you could shop based on quality and uh, convenience and availability uh, as opposed to being concerned about price because the price would be pretty much the same everywhere. So, I mean, that, so that, that, I mean, I think that is sort of a middle ground between what you were saying, um, Mike, because, um, again, in, in effect, he's talking about a standard pricing and then everybody else are, are trying to beat that. Yeah, that's true. Sure. I mean, if, if they... If, if they have a, you know, for each website, uh, for a hospital, you know, if they want to put all the prices up 
say, great. Yeah. They, they ought to have feedback. They ought to have, you know, I, and most of that's out there for most businesses. And that's, that, you know, people need that in order to feel, okay, hey, you know, this guy's got a lot of good feedback. He's, he's really good. And he would take a lot of demand and, and so on. And See, uh, they would Mike, have the prices I, out there. So go ahead. When, go I ahead. Think about, when I think about that, Mike, I think uh, prices are very important because we're talking about economics. But I would want to know what the infection rate is for the hospital. What's their success rate with the procedure that you might need versus the procedure at another location? Um, so that you could say, okay, it's really, prices are sort of the same, but, uh, you know, the heart surgery at Hospital A is a little bit better than uh, Hospital B, or the infection rate is better at Hospital A than Hospital B. And if we publish that kind of information for every hospital, I think hospitals, although they're very concerned about it now, would want to make sure they have great data, because you, you're not going to want to go to the place where you think you're going to get an infection. Right. Now, Ed, I just what you just that, said, and that, I, that's where I think there's some intersectionality with what you're saying, what I believe in, and what Mike is saying. And Mike, can you believe there's some intersectionality mm-hmm. between you and me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's well. That and mm-hmm. it, go ahead. Like, like for example, I mean, if if for ninety percent of what what you need, mm-hmm. if you go to a direct primary care cash only doctor, which is which is really growing, um. And, and and there's no there's no uh, you know pre-existing condition problem that that they have either. You know, you, if we a lot of doctors are are going for cash only because they're they're tired of the insurance companies, they're they're tired of the government bureaucrats and all that kind of stuff. And so um, that part, you know, that that's that's you know they have their prices up front. Um, you know, a lot of Healthy people, they could have a primary cash only doctor for fifty bucks a month, and catastrophic insurance for maybe a hundred dollars a month, and be a hell of a lot cheaper than any other uh, uh, single pair. I've heard that, I that, heard that so know, often. Been mentioned, uh, Mike. I hear that so often, but I don't think that is which, realistic. Which is factual. Well, I tell you what, let's, it is. let's talk about that a little bit later because I, 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 I told uh, yeah. Ed it was going to be a half hour and we're about okay. to cross that limit, but I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll hold your call. But, you know, let's, let's continue to explore that because that is very important. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to say one thing, talk to you about one other thing uh, before we go, and that had to do with, uh, we're, we're talking about the shortage of doctors, et cetera, et cetera. And, and tell me about, it. don't you think that uh, we really should be subsidized? You already are pointing out that we're going to be short 35,000 doctors. There are two solutions to that problem. One is, I know what the first solution is, and I know that's what our corporate structure is probably going to want to do, and that is that we're going to raid China, India, and, and all these other countries for doctors and given our pay structure i mean it's probably what's going to do is probably bring down the average salary for the doctors that you know that work here do first of all do you agree with that or not well i think doctors do work to come here from other countries and have for many years um i think the problem on a medical school basis is how long it takes for someone to graduate from medical school and then how long it takes for them to get comfortable in their own skin as a physician in their area of practice and i think Doctors may come here from other places, but we need to have more internships. We need to open that up. We should uh, find a way to finance education. NYU announced last year that uh, everyone in their medical school is going to go to school tuition free. Well, that's a great thing if you have an endowment that allows you to do that at the university of choice. But I think we need to restructure how how, uh, we pay for that. In other countries, in Germany, for example, and I believe in France, uh, physicians uh, do not have uh, bills for their education. And therefore, their income can be a little bit lower because they don't have to pay for the education they got. That's what I'm talking about. That is what yeah. I'm talking about. Well, it's interesting. My, my sister is um, helping form the new, uh, I don't know if you heard of Kaiser Permanente creating a new um, medical school. Yeah. Well, yeah. she's a dean She's a dean that's a recruiting and they're giving 48 uh, students free uh, a free medical degree for, I don't know if it's permanent or not, but I mean, they're, the, the, these first 48 are coming in uh, for mm-hmm. free medical education. So mm-hmm. it, it's wonderful. But uh, look, Ed, give me a closer. First of all, I enjoyed speaking to you and I enjoy what your plan has to offer. It's not Medicare for all, but it's the closest thing to bring some sanity to our healthcare system. I mean, I'll first, I'll still first go for the Medicare for all. I'd like uh, no no questions asked. Take a card 
Go. Can you give me two minutes? <laughs> well, basically, uh, what we're proposing uh, could be a vehicle to Medicare for All. If insurance companies are not interested in competing with what we call all care in our book, care for everyone under 65 uh, in a, uh, you know, a national plan that's really paid for by insurance premiums from companies, right? Basically, that's, it's not really a tax. It's, and also, all the taxes from Obamacare are not necessary in our plan. We don't need to tax uh, uh, people that make a lot of money, over 200000 We don't need to tax uh, people that make uh, medical devices. Uh, the taxes that would come into play next year for pharmaceutical companies are simply not necessary under our plan. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say that we didn't get to is if we require all of our employers to pay for insurance, that takes 16% of the people off of Medicaid immediately and their family members. That would save the government $138 billion a year. So what we're saying is our plan allows for a compromise between the left and the right. Uh, the people who are now running for president want health care for everyone. And the people on the, on the right want to reduce the cost of government. And what we're saying is our plan does both. So why don't we give it a try? And, uh, you know, that's where we are. That's why we think it's a reasonable plan to think about. That's what we spoke about in our book. And, uh, you know, we think it would actually work if uh, we could bring people together around a plan that both saves money and provides coverage for all and actually improves quality along the way. So that's where we are. I have no doubt I'll do that. Uh, Ed Icorn, thank you so kindly for having been here. Uh, Ed uh, is a director or the f founder of Med Medilink Consulting Group and the author of Healing American Health or Healing American Healthcare. Please go get that book. You can reach it on my on our website, politicsdoneright.com, in the blog for this show. Thank you so kindly for having been here, my friend. It was a great pleasure. I'd love to speak to you again in the future. Absolutely. So you have a wonderful day. You as well.